Hello, my name is Catherine Fassbender. I'm an associate professor here at UC Davis Health. I'm a member of the AIR lab at UC Davis Mind Institute and I've been working in the field of ADHD and substance abuse for a number of years now. Today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about ADHD and substance abuse. More people with ADHD use and abuse alcohol, tobacco and other substances compared to their peers without ADHD. Almost a third of adolescents with ADHD experience some kind of problem with alcohol or substance abuse and this rises to over half of adults with ADHD. Studies have estimated anywhere between 10 to 44 percent of adults seeking treatment for addiction may have ADHD and that can be diagnosed or undiagnosed. So these people may go through their whole lives not realizing that they are likely to have an ADHD diagnosis. ADHD might be particularly problematic for the treatment of addiction. Individuals with ADHD in treatment for alcohol or substance abuse tend to stick with their programs for shorter periods of time and tend to relapse more than their peers who don't have ADHD. Compared to people with substance abuse issues alone, people who have ADHD and substance abuse problems tend to begin using substances at an earlier age. They use them more often they move between different substances more rapidly and they transition from abuse to dependence much faster than their peers. They also tend to have lower rates of full remission from addiction, which is what we just discussed in that they have problems with treatment, sticking to their treatment and relapsing. Certain factors can increase the risk for substance abuse in ADHD. These include other comorbid diagnoses like oppositional defiant disorder, conduct disorder, bipolar disorder, and eating disorder, for example. Also, high school dropout can increase the risk, as can negative peer interactions and social problems. There are a number of theories as to why there's an increased risk for substance abuse in ADHD. In ADHD, there is a development and persistent persistence of social, academic, and behavioral problems that might lead down the road to experimentation with drugs of abuse. Some theories say that ADHD and substance abuse maintain each other and make each other more severe. Other theories suggest that commonalities between the disorders might be the reason that they co-occur so often. For instance, they are both externalizing disorders and they both involve disinhibition. There may be a genetic component and there are also underlying neurobiological commonalities between ADHD and substance abuse. One example is impulsivity, and this might be due to altered brain functioning in both disorders. When we talk about self-control and impulsivity, we think of impulsivity as being an impulsive choice or decision, an impulsive action. Impulsivity is one of the diagnostic criteria of ADHD, and it's also heightened in substance abuse. Studies have shown altered activity in brain regions associated with impulsivity and self-control in both ADHD and in substance abuse. We can think of impulsivity as a tension between deliberative, reasoned decision-making and control of actions, or impulsive, reflexive choices or actions. And we're constantly on a teeter-totter going between reasoned decision-making and impulsive, reflexive choices or actions. And we're faced with these choices every day in our everyday lives. For instance, should I have a salad for lunch or will I eat a cupcake instead? Or should I put my money in the bank or should I go on a spending spree? These are choices that face us every day and sometimes it's okay to make the impulsive choice. The important thing is that we should be deciding or judging between which is the better one for our future, the impulsive choice or the reason choice. In ADHD and substance abuse, they tend to make the impulsive choice more often than their peers. One important question that arises quite often in the field of ADHD is, does treatment of ADHD with stimulant medication increase the risk for substance abuse in the future? Many parents are concerned with this question. Some of the reasons that people tend to worry about this is that psychostimulants used to treat ADHD like methylphenidate, which is Ritalin, or dextroamphetamine and amphetamine, such as Adderall, are chemically similar 
and have similar mechanisms of action to drugs of abuse like cocaine and methamphetamine. They all tend to increase the amount of dopamine in the brain. Also, some stimulant medications can be abused. And there are fears that exposure to stimulant medication early in life might lead to sensitization to the drug and leave one at risk in the future. But there are some critical aspects of drugs of abuse that um, make them different from um, medications that you take um, as prescribed. And one of those is that drugs of abuse create a feeling of euphoria or high and that is a critical component of the addiction process. In the graph you can see cocaine entering the brain, that's represented by the purple line, and as it rises you can see that the person's self-reported feeling of high maps perfectly on top of the cocaine entering and leaving the brain, and this takes place over about 30 minutes. So the feeling of high is very closely linked to the cocaine entering and leaving the brain. Appropriately taking medication as prescribed by your doctor should not result in um, this high because it's absorbed through the stomach. So the rate at which dopamine is released in the brain will dictate the high as well. So certain methods of using drugs like intravenous injection or snorting or smoking the drug will cause the drug to enter your system more quickly releasing dopamine more quickly, whereas absorption through the stomach is a slower process, it releases the medication more slowly and thus you don't get a feeling of high. That's illustrated very well by this study which looked at um, IV or intravenous injections of methylphenidate versus oral administration of meth methylphenidate. And in the first graph on the left hand side you can see the blue line represents the IV injection of methylphenidate and you can see that it enters the system very quickly, whereas the purple line which represents the oral administration, the buildup is slower and it lasts longer in your system. On the right you can see the self-reported feelings of high associated with the IV injection in blue and the oral administration in purple. So you can see that people are reporting that they're feeling high with methylphenidate when it's injected and that that is closely linked to how much dopamine is released. So the more dopamine that's released, the more high that is experienced by the person. On the right hand side in purple, you can see that oral meth methylphenidate is not producing that same high. One study actually suggested that treatment of ADHD with stimulants decreased substance use in teens. There are a number of studies that suggest, however, that it neither protects nor increases the risk for substance abuse. This, these studies include an eight-year follow-up of the multimodal treatment study of ADHD. Other studies suggest that medication treatment for ADHD earlier in development might be critical. So appropriate medication treat treatment earlier in life may be protective.